But we're going to keep going with our next research presentation. Um, gambling continues to be uh, to proliferate really uh, across the country, and uh, and baseball is no different in that uh, in that regard. Uh, and daily fantasy, of course, is probably the most played uh, version of gambling. Here to talk about daily fantasy baseball and uh, the hot hand, we have Jeremy Losack. Jeremy. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. And that, that's, a, that's a tough panel to follow. Really awesome stuff. Uh, really cool things to see going forward with, with the sort of fan, fa fan motivated interactive tool, uh, tools that will be out there. So really, really excited to play with that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get started. My name is Jeremy Losak. I'm an assistant professor in sport analytics at Syracuse University, uh, presenting my paper uh, on behalf of myself, my co-author Rodney Paul, and our co-author Andy Weinbach from Coastal Carolina University. Our paper focuses on the hot hand, and I'd imagine most of you have some idea as to what we mean by the hot hand, um, but just to kind of give you a general summary, it's, it's the idea that recent performance especially recent quality performance, might be indicative of future quality performance. Uh, you might think of it as a batter who is batting 500 with seven home runs over his last 10 games. That's a batter that we might perceive as being hot, right? And if a player is hot or if a batter is hot, we might then expect him to perform well in the upcoming game. That's, that's kind of the idea of the hot hand where what we do in this paper is we, we tie this concept of the hot hand and the theoretical and uh, economic analysis of the hot hand to daily fantasy baseball, which this type of data set hasn't, there hasn't been much research done in this space. So we're really excited to be able to bring these two things together. Where we kind of stand right now, um, and by we, I mean the, the literature, us as fan perception and things like that, there is a large contingency of people who strongly believe in the hot hand. Most fans do, most players do, the media typically does. There's a strong belief that the hot, that hot players uh, will continue to be hot, right? That's, that, that's a prevailing belief. And as a participant in sports, you know, it, it, it feels like that. I know when I play basketball, um, I'm awful at shooting threes, but every once in a while I make one and then, and pretty frequently I make a second one right after that, you know, like, you know, you know what, I'm, I'm hot, right? It's a very psychologically driven concept um, that, again, many people believe in. That's kind of one side of the equation, the, or one, one, one way of thinking. The other side are where statisticians have typically been over the last 30 years, economists, empirical analysts in essentially saying, and, and what a Nobel Prize winner has kind of coined, that the idea of the hot hand is a massive and widespread cognitive illusion. Basically, this idea is, is all, it's made up. We, we perceive it as existing, um, where we're suckers to, to perception and, and personal experience and things like that. It doesn't actually exist. That it's a misunderstanding of the idea of sample size and randomness and, and over a large enough sample period, you would expect some hot streaks and some cold streaks. And if you observe enough data, it basically washes out in a large enough sample, right? So you have these two camps that are kind of embedded in opposite corners. That's shifted a little bit in recent years. There's, there's a paper by Green and Zweibel that was, that's really good in 2018 that actually was able to find evidence of a hot hand in baseball, specifically as it relates to uh, batters, who hit, who, hit, who hit recent home runs or extra base hits, they're more likely to do so in a subsequent game. And they also show that pitchers respond to the hot hand by then increasing the percentage in which they walk those batters. So they actually show not only a hot hand, but also a response to the hot hand. A couple of other papers and a couple of other sports settings have started showing the hot hand. Um, but even so, the question is still, it, it's still in debate. Right? And part of the reason why it's so difficult from the statistician perspective to identify the hot hand has to do with the idea of noise. Take, take a collection of MLB at bats. You might have different pitchers. Uh, you might have different weather conditions, stadium factors. Even if you face the same pitcher, you might have times through the order penalties or pitcher fatigue. 
uh, defensive alignment, once the ball actually goes into play, we all know there's a lot of randomness in those outcomes. So moral of the story is empirically, it is really difficult to identify the hot hand in data without having just a sheer massive amount of data in order to parse that result out. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing and where at least the literature is starting to head in in the direction of, you know, maybe there is actually in fact the hot hand, but it's probably not nearly as big as what people think it is. Um, and it's still really difficult to quantify. So that's where we kind of go with this paper. We have three central questions. First, from the perspective of daily fantasy sports, and I'll talk a little bit about what daily fantasy sports is for those who aren't familiar with it in a second, but is the hot hand present in daily fantasy scoring? So essentially, if you take a player that is hot, will they score more points for your fantasy team? Question two, essentially ask the question, how do daily fantasy providers price this idea of the hot hand? How does DraftKings view the hot hand or FanDuel view the hot hand? And then question three, how do people, how do the people who play daily fantasy sports, the, the, the fantasy players, how do they respond to the hot hand? How do they perceive it? So it's a mixture of uh, whether, how, whether this even exists and then how individual uh, parties perceive it. I'll skip that slide. And I'll come over here. So on the top right here is what, at least with, so all of our data is done using DraftKings data. Um, DraftKings is one of many daily fantasy providers. DraftKings and FanDuel are kind of the two big, big players in the space. Um, the top right shows what a user experience might look like. In a daily fantasy contest, you have a lineup. You select players. Specifically, in this case, two pitchers, a catcher, first baseman, second baseman, third baseman, shortstop, and three outfielders. Each player you select has a price, a salary associated with that player. And you are restricted by some sort of salary cap. You can't spend more in, in DraftKings contests that's typically $50,000. So you can't spend more than $50,000 accumulating your lineup. So as a, as a DFS player, your objective is to... I, put together a lineup that theoretically will maximize performance. You select your players, and what happens is those players will score you points based on their production on the field. The better they do on the field, the more, or in the game, the more points your team scores. Those scores get aggregated and get compared to others who enter into those contests. So on the top left here, we have a screenshot of what a contest might look like or a contest uh, uh, description page might look like. Some, interest, some interesting points, you have an entry fee. This one is $5. Uh, you have the number of entries or entries into the contest. You have the prize structure. So this is what's called a tiered, uh, a tiered or tournament prize structure, where the lineup that scores the most points gets the largest payout, and that declines and declines until you reach kind of a certain cutoff point. Our data set uses data from one type of contest from the 2019 MLB season. Uh, it's the MLB 10K Chin Music Contest. So not exactly this contest, but similar in terms of its, its payout structure. This contest has 2,000, each of these contests, we have 80 of them throughout the season and they're all on unique days. So 80 contest days, um, 80 contests on different days. These, these contests have about 2,400 entries each. Everyone who participates can only submit one lineup. There are contests where you could submit multiple lineups, but we focus on where you could only submit one with a $5 entry fee. The reason why we restrict our analysis to one contest is because there are certain strategical, strategic elements associated with the potential contest um, that could change some of the strategic behavior. So we wanted to uh, essentially work with the same playing field, the same strategic setting when we did this analysis. We focus just on hitters, so we're excluding pitchers from this analysis, and we focus just on hitters who are in the starting lineup. As you can kind of see here in the screenshot, it might be a little bit small, um, but when a player is announced, when the lineup is in and the player is announced in the starting lineup, that information is provided to DFS players. So we know who is in the starting lineup um, when, we, when we make our selections, if that information has been made, made available. It wouldn't make sense as a DFS player to take a bench batter. Um, those players are likely not to produce points. Um, maybe they get one pinch hit appearance. Um, typically, you're going to focus your attention on players who are actually starting in that game. So we just focus on starting hitters. 
And what we do is for each of our 80 contests, we take all of these starting hitters eligible to be selected in that contest. That, that is roughly 11,675 player game observations. And in that sample, we have data that includes this, their salary. So how much it costs to select that player, their production. So what their fantasy points ended up being. And we have their usage rate. So we know in what percentage of lineups that player was selected in on that, on that given contest day. Uh, we use retro sheets data uh, for, some, for some of the uh, metrics that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, uh, connect our databases, our, our different data sets with Chadwick, and we use some uh, betting data to get some of our covariates, which I will talk about shortly. To give you a sense as to how scoring works, it's strictly based on offensive production. So singles, doubles, triples, home runs, and other back of the baseball card type statistics, RBIs, runs, walks, hits by pitches, and stolen bases. So in at least in most DFS settings, you're not going to have any sort of advanced metrics. And again, I want to emphasize that these are traditionally, the reason it's called daily fantasy is because traditionally these are individual day contests as opposed to season long contests, which would span an entire season. So these are specifically at the daily level. Focused on individual positions, and I mentioned I break this down by position. Most players are going to, most contests will have a maximum salary for a position at around 5,500 to 6,000. Those are your Mike Trouts, Juan Soto's, Ronald Acuna's, Trey Turner's of the world. At the minimums, 2,000, 2,100. So you could see kind of the pricing discrepancy between the top and the bottom. These are going to be players who are bottom of the order hitters, uh, lower quality hitters. Uh, not much information about them, your, your, your defense first type players, et cetera. Catchers, as you can identify, typically cost less relative to other positions. For those who play season long fantasy, you'll recognize that this makes sense. Catchers offensive reduction is typically lower than that of other positions. And that's reflected in the price. Again, defense does not come into play in DFS scoring. It's just offensive production. All right. So now let's define the hot hand. The way we do that, we start with actually using 2018 data. We take every single starting offensive player's points per 100 salary. So if a player, just as an example, if a, if a 4,000 salary player scores 20 points in a game, in a particular game, you have 20 in the numerator, then you have 4,000 divided by 100 in the denominator. So 20 divided by 40 would give you 0 0.5 points per hundred salary. So that would give you a spot on the distribution around here. All right. So we start with that distribution. What we do is we take the average and then we define a threshold based on this distribution. Now I want to emphasize that one might argue that relying on standard deviations and, and all this might seem relatively arbitrary, especially given that this is clearly not normally distributed. Um, there's clearly a mass point at zero, which makes sense. If a player doesn't score any points, um, they're going to have zero here on this metric, regardless of their salary. Um, and that leads to kind of this weird kink point. The purpose of this process is to get some sort of threshold, right? We could arbitrarily assign something, but we felt that at least this approach would give us something that's at least slightly more uh, subjective or objective. We also, in our analysis, we play around with this threshold. We probably tried at least 20 or 30 different types of thresholds and analysis. The idea is we're gonna, we wanna, we wanna have an objective way of splitting our players into categories, hot, not hot. Um, I'll go over three of the ways in which we do that here. Um, but again, we do this over and over again, different ways and our results are fairly robust. So we're not too concerned about this classification. We split players up into three bins. You're either hot, you're not hot, or you don't qualify. And the reason we split out players who don't qualify is because, and, and who might be considered as not qualifying, you have players who recently come back from the injured list, who haven't played recent games, so it wouldn't be fair to call them hot, and it wouldn't be fair to call them not hot because they don't have any recent performance. Same is true of players who are just receiving a call, who are recently receiving a call up, um, and there's no historical data to work, or at least recent data to work off of. Um, same is true of platoon players, players who might start, or in certain cases, might start once a week or, or twice a week, um, certain handedness matchups, or, or you have your backup catcher, players who don't play enough to really uh, qualify in the perception of being either hot or not hot. 
So in at least our first specification to qualify, you have to have started at least six games over the previous 30 days. We played with that threshold. And again, our results remain fairly robust. Robust. In terms of how we define hot versus not hot, so that's just whether you qualify to be in that discussion. What we do is we look at your last six starts. We take your points per 100 salary average over that last six starts. And if that number exceeded our threshold, which in our first specification is half a standard deviation over the 2018 threshold, our average, then we classify you as hot. This gives us 9.2% of our players is hot, about 84% is not hot, and 7% is not qualified. We have a binary, we, have a, we use a continuous measure as our second specification. So rather than classify it based on a threshold, we just keep the, uh, the points per 100 salary as is. We have a third specification where we reduce that time to three starts in the last 15 days instead of six in 30, and then base the hot measure on your last three start production. It changes who gets classified in each bin. It doesn't change our underlying results. Some of the other variables we consider in our model, um, whether you're the home team, whether you have an offhand matchup, so lefty righty or righty lefty versus same, same side matchups, lefty lefty righty righty, whether you are a switch hitter, it's important to note that anybody who is a switch hitter also will have an offhand advantage by, by default. Implied runs uh, takes betting data um, as an ex ante measure of the expected scoring production in the game, uh, expected offensive production in the game. So it says, how many runs is your team expected to score based on betting markets? This measure is important because it will control for essentially any of the game, overall game attributes that would be relevant to the scoring environment. So that includes things like the quality of the opposing starting pitcher, the quality of the opposing bullpen, different park factors, um, and different things like that. So that, that's a um, different weather factors. All of those things kind of get captured in this implied runs variable. We'll ignore positional options for now. Maybe we'll come back to that later if there's time. Our observations are pretty, are pretty well represented across the different positions with outfield obviously having the greatest representation since you need to have three outfielders. Spot in the lineup is pretty well represented, represented, uh, represented except for the ninth spot, but that would make sense relative to the other positions as the National League typically doesn't use a starting hitter in the ninth spot in the batting order. So with all of that said, let's jump into the first question. Is the hot hand present in DFS scoring? Our methodology, our model is fairly straightforward. It's, it's ordinary least squares OLS. Um, our Y variable is points per 100 salary. And we have our various covariates listed in the model. Each of these pairs of columns use a different, one of our three, specific, our three hot hand specifications. There, again, the results were robust in the paper in our actual paper that we have written. We have we, we highlight seven of them. Our results are pretty robust, but I present three here. We'll start with our non-hot hand variables. Offhand, if you have an off lefty righty, righty lefty matchup, you're going to score more. Um, you're you're going to score more points than what would be expected of a player with a similar salary. Switch hitters score less, but again, all switch hitters are also have the offhand advantage. So the net effect is positive, just less so than a player who has an actual uh, offhand advantage. That makes sense. Switch, switch hitters might be batting from their less dominant position or side of the plate. So while they do have the offhand advantage, they lose kind of that, dom that, that dom dominance effect. Home team is negative, which on first thought might be weird. We expect there to be a home field advantage. But in DFS, it's important to recognize that opportunity is king. And if you're the home team, there is some probability you're not going to get an at-bat in the ninth inning. If you don't get an at-bat, fewer plate appearances, which then systematically would benefit away team players. So that's what's captured here. Implied runs positive, higher scoring environments leads to more scoring. Um, and like I said, I'll talk about positional options a little bit later. Going to the hot hand results, not what you would expect, at least if you thought hot hand mattered. Negative, negative, not statistically significant, negative, uh, not statistically significant. At a minimum, what we're showing is, you know, hot players do not score more. At least in this continuous variable specification, there's a negative hot hand effect. What that could signify is some sort of regression to the mean that if I'm hot the previous day or the previous couple of days, that I might revert back to my baseline performance. That's a possibility. Um, 
it's also possible this is capturing some of that green and Zweibel effect that if you are hot, that opposing pitchers might respond by walking you more, which would then lower your fantasy production. So that might be captured there as well. So at least based on these first set of results, there's no evidence that playing the hot hand improves expected scoring. Our second question, is the hot hand efficiently priced in DFS prices? So for those familiar with kind of some of the gambling literature, this type of modeling technique is pretty common in that space. Under the efficient market hypothesis, if for a market to be efficient, all relevant information is, should be captured in the price, in the price variable. That all, all information is captured in the price um, in order for the, for the market to be efficient. In this case, our price is player salary. Our Y variable is points. And if, there, if this market's efficient, if DraftKings is appropriately factoring in these different attributes, none of these things should return statistically significant except for salary, because all of this information should already be captured in salary. And here are the results. So offhanded, positive statistically significant, that suggests that DraftKings does not effectively capture handed advantage in their pricing. Home team negative, implied runs positive, et cetera. What these say is that if you are a skilled fantasy player, so those of you who are, so the, if you are trying to select your lineup, selecting a player that fits these different criterium will increase your lineup's performance relative to what that player would be expected to perform just based on the player's salary. This table here on the right breaks it down by lineup position. I only do it for this first specification, but again, the results are pretty robust. What this says is that batters later in the lineup perform worse than what is expected. DraftKings doesn't appropriately capture a lineup position. Take players batting third, second, third, fourth, et cetera. Going to the hot hand though, once again, there is no evidence of a hot hand effect. There is no evidence that hot hand is mispriced. If we combine that result with the previous result, so since being hot, at least in our results, do not indicate an increased expected point production, then by not factoring that in, they're behaving efficiently. That because these results are not statistically significant, it's efficiently priced in. And by efficiently priced in, it, it's not priced in at all. So de at least DraftKings does not, does not consider hot hand when placing prices. Why they don't do that? is a question I kind of leave up to, to others to determine and debate, but at least from, a, from an efficiency perspective, it's efficiently attributed. So then the last question is, how do people respond to the hot hand, on the hot hand? In this case, our Y variable is the natural log of field, which is the usage rate. And we have the same general model set up as before. And what we're showing here is, at least with the non-hot hand results, People take advantage of the market inefficiencies. When a player has a handed advantage, his usage rate goes up. The marginal effects of that is 42.3%. So a player's usage increases by 42.3% if he has the handed advantage. Home team, negative. Implied runs, positive. Essentially going hand in hand with those, there are those market inefficiencies we just identified. Here's where the results get interesting though. The hot hand results. In our last two specifications, we weren't showing anything, any sense of, or any evidence of statistical significance. Here we are. This is positive and statistically significant, positively statistically significant, and the same. And the less active, not qualified variable, negative. Converting these to marginal effects, these are all based on the first column uh, model. Players that are hot, if a player is hot, his usage will increase by 41.3%. If a player is classified as less active or non-qualifying, his usage declines 13%. This is despite there being no evidence that these players are mispriced, that these players produce less, or that there's any sort of advantage to taking them. So despite the fact that there's no empirical evidence that hot-handedness is an effective strategy to implement, people seem to strongly believe that there is and move in that direction. Now you might argue, well, Jeremy, at the very beginning of the presentation, you said you need a lot of data to break through the hot. And that's true. It is very reasonably reasonable to postulate that there is in fact a small hot hand effect that we just can't identify in our data set. That being said, and where I counter that in terms of our results, is that if you consider the marginal effects for hot hand, and let's say offhand, 
So these two have very similar marginal effects. If we go back a few slides, or go back a few slides, offhand was clearly mispriced in, in, in the pricing mechanism, hot hand, not, not nearly as close. We go back, hot hand, not clearly the same sort of effect as offhand. Offhand clearly has an effect on scoring. So what, if there is in fact a hot hand, it's likely very small. And the response that people make to the hot hand is disproportionate to what that actual effect is, that people respond too much to the hot hand. So in conclusion, there doesn't appear to be much evidence that there is a hot hand effect in, DF in, base, in fantasy and MLB DFS, at least with DraftKings data. There's no evidence that taking hot players results in better performance. And yet there is a massive consumer response to the hot hand. And that really fits with the idea of widespread cognitive illusion that there, we perceive there to be a hot hand. It's not clear whether or not there actually is. And that's kind of the moral of the story. So thank you all very much. Um, I will jump into some questions now and pull up the questions. Let's see. So Tobias asked, if you were theoretically able to take away the external factors, would there be any specific numbers that would quantify a hot-handed batter? So at least in the literature, the way people have approached it is, is varied. Um, it, in basketball, you view a good basketball example. The reason why most of the basketball hot-handed papers look at free throw percentage is because that strips away a lot of external factors, right? Um, and then there's a clear production measure. In baseball, there's a number of potential production measures. Um, and there's an, so much noise out there that you'd have to, you'd have to identify, um, it, it, it'd be tough, it'd be tough. I mean, there's no, there's no, it's like, the, it's like clutch, right? You could try to produce a clutch metric in the same sort of way that you could try to produce a hot hand metric. Um, it, in the end, it's going to be somewhat arbitrary. Um, I, uh, let's see, I've gotten a couple of questions. Have I tried doing this and have been successful in winning money in fantasy leagues? Um, so, as I so as I showed you, there is an increase in usage of hot players. It's not clear though, if taking hot players actually hurts your performance. In daily fantasy, there's a strategy that you want your lineups to actually be uh, have kind of a, a contrarian feel. Um, you wanna differentiate your lineups relative to other people. And where I'm going to go follow up wise on the research is to see if skillful DFS players actually do try to follow an anti hot hand strategy. Um, let's see. Eli asked, why did you consider, consider linear weights over an ML approach? The answer is mostly because the ML approach was, it was a simple enough approach and it got the case across. I mean, you can make these models as complicated as you want. Um, at the end of the day, um, the underlying mechanism is, is fairly straightforward. Um, my guess is a machine learning type model would uncover a, a fairly similar result. Um, so the question is, is a trade-off between simplicity versus uh, interpretation and, and application, right? Um, and that's really what I'm going for here. If I wanted to actually build my own DFS model, I wouldn't use a linear model. But for the case of statistical inference, this was useful in, in, in this sort of approach. Um, let's see. Keith asks, is there a way to include quality opponent into your model? So the answer to that question is yes. And I do that with the implied runs variable. So betting market data, the reason why betting market data is great, regardless of if you're actually work, like trying to improve your betting market outcomes, is because there are really good ex ante ex measures of what we expect uh, a game to be like. If a team has an expected runs total of 4.5, that means based on all of the things we know prior to the game, using all of that information, the expected runs that will be scored is 4.5. That means if I face, if I'm facing a better starting pitcher, that's going to be included in that expected run total. Um, if I'm included, if I'm, if I'm playing in Colorado, that's going to be priced in. So we are effectively controlling for that using those betting market measures. Okay. Um, so John asks, 
I was wondering if you looked at how these findings break down by DFS scoring subcomponent. That's an interesting question. It's certainly possible that hot handedness might be more prevalent in certain statistics, um, hits, home runs, stolen bases, et cetera. There might be some more nuanced applications of hot hand. It gets more difficult, obviously, once you start digging in um, and identifying that. Plus, you lose a little bit of the consumer based analysis that we get from looking at the overall scoring production. Because if you're a daily fantasy player, your goal is to maximize total points. How you get those points is not insignificant, but of less importance. So I think it's interesting from a general hot hand perspective. I don't know if it would be as prevalent in kind of the DFS applications. Um, let's see. I think I have time for one more question. Uh, Tom asks, have you ever thought of studying slumps instead of hot hand? As a fan, slumps seem even more likely to exist to me than necessarily the hot side. I think that's actually a really interesting point. I think slump, we might respond differently as consumers to slumps versus the hot hand. There might be a different behavioral response. That's a really interesting question. I think one that's definitely worth follow-up to see if the, if the response to slumps is, is actually the same in the opposite direction. So really, really good question there. All right. Well, I think that's all the time I have. So I will hand it back to Scott. Thank you, Jeremy. Really appreciate you uh, coming back to the conference this year.